Our first guest tonight is an Emmy-winning talk show host and actress you know from movies such as A League of Their Own and Sleepless in Seattle. She stars in the new series American Gigolo. New episodes air Friday nights on Showtime. Let's take a look. You said you talked to that guy. Finnegan. Finnegan. Kevin Finnegan. Right. Yeah, I talked to him. Okay. What'd he say? Well, it was hard to tell what he was saying. He was on his deathbed. He was nearly gone, you know? I get in there and I said, who hired you? Who hired you? Who hired you? I'm talking about this case. And I don't know what he heard. I don't know what, but he started like mumbling stuff. Didn't make a lot of sense. Didn't sound like words either. But I thought maybe it would make some sense to you. What did he say? He said keen. Please welcome back to the show and to her former studio, the one, the only, Rosie O'Donnell, everybody. <laughs> Do you feel it? I mean, I know the physical space is the same. It looks so different. It looks very different, but coming in here, you get the like, whoa. Yeah. That was, that was a, a quarter of a century ago. Right? It was a quarter century. It was, yeah, I guess 20 plus years. Yeah. And you did it, I guess it was about six, seven years you did your show? Six years. Yeah. Yeah. Doing it live. You do, we're doing it live as well. That's a whole nother thing. And it's kind of keeps you on your toes, though. Yeah. I didn't want some studio executive to come and say, I didn't really enjoy the Dom DeLuise cooking segment. Could you do it again? Right. And I was like, can't. We're live. It's out there. I want to ask real quick, because I was lucky enough to uh, uh, be on stage uh, presenting uh, this award to Shirley Ralph last night, which was Thank really. Fantastic. A stunning uh, moment. First of all, a well-deserved award. She's doing fantastic work this year on television. But yes. it was uh, it was scene stealing at a night where obviously the best in television are there. You know, I've known her since she was in the original cast of Dreamgirls and on the Flintstones, she played the adoption agency that got me Bam Bam. Uh -huh. And so I've known her for a long time and she's a genius. She's an amazing artist, an amazing woman. And I was so proud of her, the way she delivered her speech and she sang from her heart. And I don't know, it was, I was crying at home watching it. It was a really special thing to be in the room for because you realized in the way that you've overlapped with her, you got the sense that she's been doing this for so long. Yes. And so many different places that she had probably just in, affected everybody's life in there at some place. And they were all so proud and happy for her. Yeah. And her, and to see someone be able to really live in the moment. Like, I don't know, when, when I've won an award, I'm always sort of out of my body and yeah. kind of like watching it going, oh my God, I got to say something, try to be funny, get to the backstage area, hold in your stomach. Like, <laughs> I don't ever take the moment. Like, yeah. to see somebody just live authentically and just land there and go, this is what I'm feeling. You it know? was really cool to see. It was see. very beautiful. I agree. I loved the Emmys, by the way. I, I thought, thought it was great. I thought they were great last night. Yeah, I thought they were, you know, wrong on, you know, one or two. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't mean it. I don't mean it. <laughs> I love that, though. Yeah. I love the faces when, you know, you could see the woman or the man who doesn't win. And it's just a, like, millisecond of, oh, crap. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, that's when you go, you really didn't deserve, because right now you're being a terrible actor. You exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. When they're like, hmm, yeah, isn't that nice? Um, I was very happy for Gene Smart. Yeah. That show hacks his genius. It's and so she great. is astonishing. Very similar. Someone who's been around forever and just doing such great work, and then all of a sudden, a couple of, you know, Projects come that everybody's watching, and it felt like collectively you all said, oh, Jean Smart has been amazing forever, and, and, and finally and the, what she deserves. She's just been funny nonstop through her yeah. whole career. And um, she's doing dramatic roles now, and this role, I think, fits her like a glove. Yeah. And I, I just love the show. I think it's absolutely epic. And it's a hard thing to do when you play a comedian, because yes. you have to be believably funny in a way. Which she totally is. She really is. And the stand-up part. Remember Sally Field did the stand-up show Punchline? Yes. You know, it's a hard thing to learn. But uh, because she's maybe naturally a comedian, she killed it. Mm -hmm. She killed it at the stand-up club. Like, you're watching going, this is so believable. I just read a, a, a wonderful interview uh, with you in The New Yorker about your early stand-up days, that you decided to do that as a path to find your way on stage uh, on Broadway. Yes. And so what was it about stand-up that you thought might be the first step there? Because it does seem a little unconventional. Well, there was a kid in my class named Craig Benervini, and his older brother, Richie, was a stand-up comic. And he was older by, like, 15 years. And so he came to see our senior show where you make fun of everyone. Yeah. And uh, I was the star of it, making fun of all the teachers. And he said, you should be a stand-up comic. And I said, 
I really want to be on Broadway or a backup singer for Bette Midler. Uh -huh. You know, I didn't, um, <laughs> the fact that I can't sing didn't really stop yeah, me no. from, from dreaming that. I think, yeah, Bette Midler will take anybody. She's she not really a perfectionist. She really will, you know. Yeah. To be a harlot, that's what her backup yeah, singers were called. Yes, <laughs> that was my goal in life, and to get in a Broadway show. And so I said to him, Richie, I don't want to do it. And he said, well, come down tomorrow night. It was a Saturday night, and all the kids from my high school were there. And I had no material, because I was 16. And I'd say, like, oh, you know what? Marilyn's dating Mitchell, and Steve doesn't know. <laughs> and the class of seniors were like, oh, my god, that's so good. And so I got, like, a standing ovation. And the owner of the club, Richie, comes over to me and says, um, Rosie, why don't you come back tomorrow? And I thought, ah, oh, it's a school night. I don't know. It's a Sunday. My friends will OK. And I, I went back, and I killed. I mean, I bombed. <laughs> I mean, I bombed a death that could have been heard in other countries <laughs> far away. Uh, it was pure silence. And I walked off and he said, so that's pretty much the life of a comic. You kill it one night and you really suck the next. And uh, why don't you come back and be the MC? Oh, and wow. that's how I learned to do stand up, by watching all those comics for so many years and being the one to introduce them and then sit in the club and watch them. That's fascinating because I bet you were both learning how to be a comic by watching, but I bet you were also learning host skills by being an MC because that- 100%. Is, yeah. Because that is, the host job, certainly at those stand-up nights, is to make the room better for the people who are going to come on stage. Exactly. And I would imagine you were great at that. I really loved doing it, because I really loved supporting the other acts. I really loved getting the crowd ready and not doing too much to spoil them for the headliner or whatnot. And then Shirley Hempel was the headliner. And she came in and she saw me on the open mic night before, and she said um, to the club owner, Richie, you're going to pay her $50 a show and she's going to open for me this weekend. And he said, no way. We pay her 20 bucks to MC the whole night, and we're not doing that. And she said, then I'm walking. And she literally threatened to walk out of the club, and he had to fold, and he hired me, and he, I made $300 in a weekend. When you're 16, <laughs> I thought I was like Leona Helmsley. I'm like, everybody, or Oprah, you have a car, you have a car, you know? Um, that's wonderful. You also, uh, obviously, you're back in, in your old studio. You got to revisit another uh, piece of your old work. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, League of Their Own television show right Fantastic. now. Fantastic. That you guys do a, a cameo in. Yes. And uh, we've talked in the past about the film itself, which is, uh, it's really perfection. It, it really it, is. And it's so tight, and it's so well-crafted, and the performances are, are indelible. And w did you have any hesitation when you heard, oh, they're going to... They're going to make a series. Well, I met Abby Jacobson with Natasha Leone. I'm friends with Natasha. We did a play together. And she's introduced me to these 30-year-old kids who are unbelievably gifted. And so she brings Abby to dinner. And Abby says, I met with Penny. This is like 2018. And she said she would be very supportive of us doing uh, a show that League of Their Own is based on, but more looks into the sexuality and the private lives and the racism that occurred. And I remember thinking, that's going to be tough, right? But I didn't say that to her. I said, well, all the support you need, if you ever need me to play like a butchy bartender, just call me up, you know? <laughs> and so when the show was, she called me up. She said, remember that butchy bartender you are? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> she said, will you come to Pittsburgh? And I walked in to the set, and here are all these 30-year-old women, like I was when I did it wearing our uniforms, saying like the lines in the vernacular of the 1940s. And it was like I flashed back all of a sudden and I realized that was half my life ago. Yeah. Because I'm 60. And I was 30 when I was doing that show. And I just looked at them and thought, what an amazing 30 years you guys have left. That was the start of my career. And this is the start of many of their careers. And to look back at 60 and go, my God, what you have coming up, is going to be thrilling. It must also be thrilling for you to notice in those 30 years, you know, sexuality was, you can maybe say, was some subtext to the original film. Uh, and for not really. Barely, right? Yeah. But the fact that it gets to be so out in the open and the focus of it now, I mean, I think you were a huge part of the advancements in the last 30 years, but well, that must be so such much. a cool thing to see. Thank you very much. It's overwhelming. Yeah. You know, it really is. When I, when I watch the show, I can't believe that we're able to have representation. You know, when we did the actual series, we would meet the uh, original members of the Peaches, or, and they'd be like, you know, 88, and say, oh, this is my um, 
roommate Betsy. I'm like, oh, hi, Betsy. Uh, obviously, you played shortstop. She was like, yeah, I did. And I'm like, OK, and how long have you guys been roommates? Oh, 52 years. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's just society has changed so much. People don't realize. They say, why didn't Penny add that? Well, in 1991, when we were shooting it, nobody was out. Katie Lang wasn't out, yeah. right? I mean, there, it was a different time. And, and I couldn't really believe where we have gone in the 30 years, although there's a lot more mm -hmm. to go. And, and I think that representation is the first step. And Abby Jacobson hit it out of the park, so to speak, uh, in this League of Their yeah. Own thing. She really did. Well, it was, uh, it, yeah, she did an incredible job. And it was really wonderful to see you in that. It's wonderful to have you back here. Thank you Thank so much, you. Rosie. Thank you. You're Great always welcome. You. Any You're time. always welcome. Rosie O'Donnell, everybody. New episodes of American Gigolo air Friday nights on Showtime. We'll be right back with Kevin Smith.